morning we're talking about prescription drug abuse with clinical psychologist Dr. Stephen Ragusi. And now prescription drug abuse has become our nation's fastest growing drug problem. Dr. Ragusi, what exactly does the term pill mills mean? Pill mills are, uh, that term pill mill is a term that's used to describe uh, businesses that are set up primarily to make money off of addictive drugs that are prescription drugs we're not talking about things that are non-prescription drugs we're talking about prescription drugs that people want to buy in large quantities so for example <clears throat> a pill mill might be a place that has a physician working there who will write prescriptions literally for anybody for anything. Um, sometimes people who go there never even seen a physician. They've never seen a physician or, or a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. What happens is they'll see a clerical person out front and they'll tell them what prescription they want and the clerical person will write their name on the prescription and then select from a group of waiting prescriptions signed by the doctor or, the, or whatever medical provider it is and then give it to the person and say that'll be $100 please and that's how it's done and pill mills can prescribe or dispense uh, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of drugs in a very short time I don't know how those are, are legal. Well, the, the, and the answer is be, they're, they're legal in the sense that the prescriber is legally licensed to prescribe. Mm -hmm. But they're supposed to see the patient. They're supposed to examine the patient. They're supposed to determine whether or not there's an appropriate medication for the patient. <clears throat> and in these situations, they don't. Ultimately, the fact that they don't winds up leading the physicians to have complaints lodged against them with the medical board. Their licenses are taken away. Um, they may be brought up on ethics charges. They may be sued civilly. There are a number of different ways to combat pill mills. And states have increasingly um, uh, legislated laws that uh, make it more and more difficult for pill mills to get off the ground. Here in Key West, the, the city is very interested in pill mills and is doing everything they can to make sure that they don't pop up. Mm -hmm. um, we have had, in the past, we have had physicians here um, who operated essentially pill mills. And you didn't even have to go in the office. They stood at the back door. <clears throat> um, one physician had, uh, what's it called, a French door, where the top, or Dutch door, where the top opens and the bottom doesn't. So their door to the outside was a Dutch door like that. And um, uh, the clerical person would simply stand there and the patients wouldn't even come in the, in the office. They'd be outside and they'd hand them the prescription and take their money. Oh my goodness. That was some years ago. But, but that was happening here. Yep. Well, thankfully it's not, not happening as we know of that, That's today. right. We all just need to be more careful, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I don't want to put all the blame on physicians because that's really a relatively small number. Mm -hmm. Most physicians, nurse practitioners, um, uh, uh, and other prescribers of medications do so very responsibly and they're very cautious about this stuff. Um, but um, uh, it is us. You know, Pogo, many years ago, there was a comic strip called Pogo, and he was, uh, he was investigating pollution, and, uh, and eventually, after finding all this trash all over the swamp, he said, we have met the enemy and he is us. <clears throat> and, and that's the problem here. Um, if we didn't ask for these drugs, if we didn't demand them in some sense, mm -hmm. what would happen is, is that we wouldn't get addicted to them. Mm -hmm. So we have to be cautious about it. There are many ways to control pain. Nobody should be in pain if there are ways to control that pain. Okay? And, and what are some of those ways, Dr. Ragusea, that we can control the pain that we may be in? They vary widely. Um, one of the ones that I use is hypnosis. Um, hypnosis has been around for centuries. Um, it isn't very good for things, quite frankly, like quitting smoking or losing weight, but it's really good at helping people control pain. It's really good to teach people how to relaxate, relax with. Um, it's good for relaxation, is what I was going to say. Um, and, um, but it's excellent for pain control for short periods. 
And uh, so that's one way. Um, acupuncture is terribly useful for some kinds of pain. Mm -hmm. um, for other kinds of things, it's really quackery. But there are some kinds of pain for which it's really proven to be quite effective. For example, spinal pain. I've used it for a herniated disc that I had. I found it the single most effective pain reliever I tried. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, it's also very good for peripheral neuropathy, for example. Pain or numbness in the hands and feet. Um, uh, so acupuncture is another. Um, another form of pain control um, has to do with um, other kinds of psychological techniques. Um, uh, for example, one of the things that we know is that people who sit around thinking about their pain all day feel more pain. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, people who engage in life and have a good time report less pain, even though they have essentially the same problem as somebody who's complaining about more pain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, being alive is an antidote to pain in some sense, being vibrantly alive, I should say. And um, so that's another technique. Um, there are medications that can be used that are not addictive, that are not habituating. And there are ways to use medication that will minimize the likelihood of them being addictive. For example, you can use one pain medication for a period of time and then try a different one. Um, and then switch to a different one. So if you take them for briefer periods, they tend to be less often addictive sometimes. Um, same thing's true with other, we're talking about pain meds right now, but there are other kinds of issues like anxiety, for example. Too often, we throw tranquilizers at people like they're M&Ms, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the drugs that we refer to as minor tranquilizers are in a class called benzodiazepines. And these drugs are wonder drugs for short periods of time, but to take them every day, uh, three or four times a day for minor anxiety or panic attacks, for example, mm -hmm. is just so wrong, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. um, number one, we can fix minor anxiety and panic attacks most of the time using psychotherapeutic techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. Mm -hmm. And we can do it in a very short time. But in addition to that, these drugs become habituating, mm -hmm. <coughs> habit-forming, therefore, and then ultimately addictive. You get to a point with these drugs where you can begin having seizures from taking the drug, or if you stop taking them, you can have seizures. And the drug seizures can be so severe that you can die from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I've met people who um, have been taking benzodiazepines for over 50 years, four or five times a day. Think about that. Mm -hmm. no, it, it's crazy to think about. And like you said, there are other options available. We'll talk more about this subject at a later date, Dr. Ragusi, but thank you for being on with me this morning. Okay, happy I'm, to be here. <laughs> I'm gonna take a quick break right now. I'll be right back after these messages. Stay with me.